Hello, it's David from David Savory Electrical Services and look what I've got, a pre-release copy of the 18th edition wiring regulations, or the Big Blue Book as it shall come to be known. Well, not really. In fact, it won't be for another three months that scum such as myself will finally get hold of a copy of the BBB and be able to view the wondrous changes within that will no doubt make my working life that little bit more difficult. But then, that's the problem with updates to the regs. Those of us trying to run a legitimate and compliant business just end up having to observe tougher requirements and more paperwork while the cowboys carry on regardless, which is why you should always refer to this site if you're a homeowner looking to appoint an electrician. For all the money forked over to the likes of the IET for the new publications and amendments, and all the money the competent person schemes take, when was the last time you ever saw any of them run a primetime TV or other effective advertising campaign informing the public that they should always use a qualified and accredited electrician to ensure their work is safe, insured, and that certification should be expected afterwards? When is the Electrical Competent Persons Register, your one-stop site to find all registered electricians in England and Wales, ever promoted to the public? Instead, your average civilian assumes the builder or bathroom fitter they've hired knows what he's doing when he dicks around with the electrics, sometimes with results that are either comedic or tragic, but always costly to put right. But I digress, and I don't want to get into a rant here today. That is perhaps something for another video, as we're here now to talk about my providing you with some top tippery for passing the 17th edition exam, or the 18th edition exam if you're viewing this in or after the latter half of 2018, and assuming the structure of the 18th edition exam doesn't change to what I have experienced previously. As the qualified supervisor for my company, I myself shall be taking the 18th, probably through NICEIC's training regimen soon after the exam becomes available. So if they have made changes to the structure of the exam and I find my advice here today to be incorrect, I'll upload a new video afterwards. Now, uh, let me tell you who this video is for. It's aimed at apprentices and college students who are committed to gaining the requisite qualifications and knowledge over time in order to thrive in this industry. It's also aimed at those already working in the field who may lack this specific certification because they are not currently a qualified supervisor, but may become one either through promotion or because they are becoming self-employed and intend to register, register themselves with a CPS. It is aimed too at those who may well already have experience of passing exams for previous editions of the wiring regulations, but who naturally don't feel comfortable in a classroom or exam environment, and who may be seeking a few reassuring pointers before going through it all again. You could be a great electrician out on the tools, but if you go to pieces under the pressure of exam conditions, then maybe these tips will help you. Conversely, this video is not aimed at people who have no real qualifications or skills in electrical work and think that by passing the 17th or 18th edition exam somehow qualifies or justifies them to call themselves an electrician. Think of this exam as your driving theory test. Taking that test may show you know your way around the highway code, out of date though my copy here may be, but it doesn't mean you're competent at actually driving a car. Only time invested in gaining experience and confidence and by furthering your knowledge through research can you be considered as being road ready. Similarly, passing the 17th or 18th edition exam really only proves one thing, that you can find your way around this particular book. All the time I come across gash installers who can't tell a screwdriver from a hammer from the rusty hole in their own backside, yet they claim to be an electrician because they've got the 17th edition. Well, that's nonsense. Passing the 17th or 18th edition exam means absolutely nothing on its own. If you haven't had your arse in the grass on some long-term college courses or through the apprenticeship route, then don't expect a two-hour multiple-choice exam to suddenly rubber stamp you as making the grade. OK, uh, so we're only about two minutes in now, and already I'm going off on a second rant. Let's get back on topic. Let's talk briefly about what's in the regs book before I pass on my top 12 tips. If you've invested in this pricey publication, then you'll know it's a shit read with no heroes or murders, no plot twists or princesses. It can be difficult to interpret, it can be open to interpretation. It does give some hard facts in some places while doling out recommendations in others. It is non-statutory, so none of this is law and can be ignored if you like, but abiding by it is considered to be best practice, and demonstrating you did it by the book means it is less likely to keep you from causing death or injury, which will be frowned upon by the laws of the land, specifically by the Electricity at Work regulations, which is statutory. Under EAWR Regulation 29, if you cause damage, injury or death through electrical tomfoolery, then you will be assumed guilty unless you can prove you did it by the book. And that generally means this book, 
or uh, specific manufacturer's instructions for the equipment you're installing. And this brings me on to tip number one, which is to read the bloody thing. I don't mean cover to cover while lying in bed, but flick through it and get to know its layout. Recognise what the different chapters and appendices contain. I've gone into my previous exams with other fellows who have pristine copies of the regs book, which I have clearly never opened. Look how ragged and thumbed my copy is. The purpose of the whole exam uh, is for you to demonstrate that you can navigate this very publication. So if you go into, into the exam having never even parted its pages, then you'll be wasting your time and money. And previously, as I've sat there towards the end of the two hours, confident that I've answered all 60 questions and rechecked my answers, I can see those who are still hopelessly sweating over question 21 because they didn't read the book and respect the process, and I shall look upon them with disdain as they don't deserve to be working in this field as competition to my business. But I appear to be drifting back into rant mode again. So as I say, uh, familiarise yourself with the book, and tip number two, Highlight sentences that stand out to you, things you find interesting, things you didn't know, things you thought you knew but were wrong, and any odd numbers or values that may be of interest, such as RCD disconnection times, for example. Let's take a random glance at some of the things I've highlighted over the years. OK, it's random highlight time, so let's just open up the book here and have a look at a few uh, pages, uh, or a few highlights on some of the pages here. Just pick something, hopefully, at random. Here we go. What have we got here? Section, uh, section 4. Uh, simultaneously accessible exposed conductive parts should be connected to the same earthing system. Well, uh, hopefully goes without saying, but um, interesting enough to be highlighted at some stage. Um, a little flick through and see if we can find something else. Uh, the use of RCDs is not recognised as a sole means of protection. There you go. Uh, so you need to uh, use your RCD with uh, some kind of overcurrent protection as well, like a fuse or a circuit breaker, uh, or um, any one of the protective measures specified in sections 411 to 414. Um, uh, warning notices, earthing and bonding, a durable label, label to BS951 uh, shall be permanently fixed in a visible position at or near your bonding connections, or uh, whatever connections I've got listed there, earthing, bonding, uh, main earthing terminal, we're separate from the main switch gear. So, you know, uh, a lot of it should be um, fairly basic and should be the sort of stuff that's in your head already, but there are the odd things that you'll come across uh, you uh, perhaps don't, um, don't deal with every day. Uh, what have we got here? Wiring system shall withstand the expected external influences such as wind, ice, formation, temperature and solar radiation. Again, some of these things may, may be just common sense, but it's, it's knowing where they are in the book. Um, and highlighting is effective in order to help aid you in finding that information again, should you ever need to refer back to it. But the chances are that if a sentence stand out, stands out to you as being relevant, then it may well be important to those writing the exam questions too. So as you flick through the book to locate the answers to questions, some may naturally stand out uh, from the page because you already, already highlighted it as being interesting. I have heard some people say you shouldn't mark the regs book, but bookmarking and highlighting are fine according to City and Guilds. Uh, obviously don't go inserting pages of notes into the book before an exam, don't have lots of writing on there. You're going to have a few annotations on there, probably um, because of things like the errata, which we should come on to in a later tip. In fact, there's, there's one there, um, so we'll, uh, we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, but highlighting uh, is fine, and of course, uh, as you update your regs book, obviously we'll be going from yellow to blue shortly, but we did go from green to yellow and from red to green before that, and so on and so forth. Uh, each, each book where you've gone through and made your highlights, go page for page and transfer those highlights to the new book. Um, because obviously um, if they were interesting to you before, they're nowhere less interesting now. So you don't necessarily need to read the whole thing again and go through it. Obviously you need to be aware of the changes, the differences between them. But go through and transfer your highlights from the, the old book to the new book so that they're still there uh, and still easily uh, findable and relevant to you uh, as you change books. Tip number three is to find the answer to the question. What a stupid thing to say, right? Well, talk about pointing out the obvious. What I mean by that is if you can find an answer in black and white, then you know the point for that question is in the bag. You can guess answers if you're cocksure that you definitely know which one of the multiple choices is correct, but if you have any doubt, then go find that answer in black and white. However, don't take too long about it, and that moves me on to tip number four, which is to use the flag function. This is an online exam, albeit one held at an improved training centre, so you'll be clicking on your chosen answer with a mouse. 
but if you don't know the answer to a question and cannot find it inside of well about 90 seconds or so then click your best guess answer then click the flag button on the screen and move on to the next question when you get to the end of the exam you can view which questions were flagged and prioritize them for further checking over those answers you're more confident about if you run out of time and don't get to reevaluate your best uh, quick best guess answer well, at least you have made a guess, and a guessed question has a 1 in 4 chance of being correct, unlike a question you haven't answered at all. Speaking of reviewing your answers, tip number 5 is to manage your time. I've briefly talked about time already, but 60 questions in 2 hours means an average time of about 2 minutes per question. You'll want to answer a significant number of questions well within this time limit in order to give you some time at the end to review your answers and to research those flagged questions that you only guessed at. Those working in the field or putting time and study in at college will be able to answer many questions quickly, either because they know the answer outright or because they know where to find it. To make it easier to find the answers in the book, tip 6 is to use these sticky tabs to bookmark the 7 sections along the top and the 16 appendices along the side, or the 17 appendices in the 18th edition as a new one is being added on energy efficiency. Also, bookmark any handy reference sections. I, for example, have tabs for the index, table index, figure index, adiabatic equation, and the symbols for a uh, quick reference. Tip 7 is to recognise the section relating to the question being asked. From my previous experience, the questions start from the beginning of the book and generally move forward. That means if you've answered a bunch of questions from section 4, which is about protection for safety, then look out for the first question that moves into section 5, selection and erection of equipment. I don't recall questions going back to prior sections in my previous exams, so once you've moved on to a new section, then you shouldn't have to waste time searching for answers in earlier sections. When it comes to finding answers, I have tip number 8, which is a golden one. Now, you can't take any papers into the exam with you, but you can ask for some scrap paper which the invigilator should provide you. As you answer each question, write down the question number on the scrap paper along with the page number where you think you found the answer. If you have time to review your answers at the end of the exam, then you can use this reference to quickly go back to the page you sourced each answer from in order to check that you're happy with it, which saves you having to try to find it all over again. If you found the answer for question 9 on page 75, and the answer for question 11 on page 90, but you had to flag the answer for question 10 because you couldn't find it in a timely manner, well, there is a good chance the missing answer is somewhere between pages 75 and 90. So when you go back to it at the end of the exam, you know where you should be concentrating your search efforts. It doesn't always work like that, and in my experience, the odd question does jump back a page or two, albeit not back out of the section entirely, but it gives you a bloody good idea of where you should be looking. Tip 9. Can't quickly find the answer in the regs book anywhere in the section it should be in? Well, don't forget you can also take in the on-site guide. The job of this book is to provide common information in a more easily readable and accessible format, and it may present the answer in a more obvious fashion. Again, you should be bloody familiar with this book and the same page marking and highlighting applies. Bookmark each section down the side and at the top mark sections you may want quick answers to. In my case I have wiring resistance, RCD times, current carrying capacities and maximum ZS times specifically bookmarked. A question on the 5 times operation of a 30 milliamp RCD installed for additional protection is more easily found in the on-site guide than in the regs book but then that kind of answer should already be in your head for immediate recall and a nice time-saving bonus. Besides the on-site guide, the answer to a question may also be found more readily elsewhere in the regs book. As an example, a question on cable colours might not be found in section 5, selection and erection, despite it having specific regulations on cable identification, but it might be easier to find what you're after in Appendix 7, which explicitly details cable colours. Sometimes browsing the table index or figure index can point you in the direction of where you want to be looking. One other thing to say about finding the answer is that sometimes you can't. When I was last on a course at college, my lecturer said they had identified mistakes in exam questions in previous years which they had fed back to city and guilds, but the students were still reporting incorrect or no-win questions. I myself came across one when I took the Amendment 3 exam. And although I can't remember the specific question now, I do recall that two of the answers I was presented with were correct, and that I had both of them in front of me in black and white. I didn't know which one I was expected to select, but when told afterwards that I'd got one answer wrong, well, that was the only question I had any doubts over. The uh, cynic in me thinks that City and Guilds throw in the occasional curveball on purpose to keep the 100% pass rate down, but then again, maybe they're just dicks. I'm not saying you can't get 100% in this thing, just that there may be a trip-up question. Your task is to identify it as such and not to waste an inordinate amount of time scratching your head over it. 
Tip 10 is to read and reread the question, but despite the time limit, don't speed read it. They love to throw in a double bluff or a trip up, for example. A 230 volt ACTN circuit serving socket outlets protected by a BSEN 60898 32 amp type B circuit breaker may have an RCD for additional protection not exceeding 30 milliamps and an operating time at 5 delta N not exceeding A 0.4 seconds, B 5 seconds, C 40 milliseconds and D 0.2 seconds. The sneaky buggers are dangling numbers you should know off the top of your head in front of you in an attempt to rush you into misreading the question in the hope of a time bonus. They want you to speed read that the question is about disconnection times and to clock the specific mention of a 32 amp type B MCB, which may lead you to quickly answer it as A, 0.4 seconds. What a waste time poking around regulation 411.3.2.2 and 411.4.7, but that would be wrong. The question here is asking about the five times RCD operating time, not the circuit breaker disconnection time, the answer of which is C, 40 milliseconds, and can be found in the same section but a few pages further on in regulation 415.1.1 or in the on-site guide under section 11. It may look obvious here, but when you're in the exam environment and under pressure to answer quickly, it's simple slip-ups over questions like this that can lose you easy points. Tip 11 is to know your changes. There are specific differences between the 17th and 18th editions, and it's a pretty safe bet that the 18th edition exam will want to test you on those changes. So there's a good chance one or more question may relate to what's new, in which case, if you're well versed in the differences, then it should be a quick win answer. Besides the obvious differences between the 17th and 18th editions though, you should also be aware that after publication, errors and omissions may come to light which cause the IET to release on their website a corrigendum. This last happened in 2013, then again in 2016, affecting the 17th edition regs book, the on-site guide and guidance notes 3 and 7. When errata are published, you need to know what those errors are and to update your books accordingly. In this example, my on-site guide has an erratum added in on page 125 to correct the impedance values originally printed, while in my regs book I have used red pen to change the misprints or errors as published. Hopefully, the 18th edition will have fewer foul-ups when it rolls off the press in July. I should also mention that you should always source these books from a reliable supplier and beware of any appearing online that are cheap. These publications are expensive and hold their value throughout their life, so you are unlikely to find someone sending legitimate and current examples at a knockdown cost. Cheap versions may be counterfeit, in which case the information contained within may be false, or you might end up being sold an older copy instead of the up-to-date version you thought you were getting. Electrical wholesalers sell legitimate copies, or you can use online websites so long as they're trustworthy and guarantee a genuine copy. That is to say, avoid the likes of eBay. Thankfully, as it's uh, wine o'clock, we're at my final tip, which is number 12. Oh yeah, nectar. And number 12 is don't cheat. If passing the exam is important to you, then do it properly. Pride yourself on your knowledge. Aim to work with electrics safely and correctly. Don't try and shortcut it. This stuff is about your safety as someone working in the electrotechnical industry and also your client's safety. You know those nice people who pay you for your knowledge and skills? If you lack the knowledge and skills, then passing this exam by cheating won't help you. It certainly doesn't make you an electrician. It's merely a requisite part of a larger process. For those legitimately getting through the exam because they've studied hard on improving their knowledge and skill sets, and I wish you good luck, and I hope I have helped you here in some small way today. For those who think that passing the exam is enough on its own for them to start charging people for electrical work, well, I hope you kill yourself before any innocent member of the public. Cheers. <laughs>